In this screencast, we're going to take a look at ModelSim, the simulation software that we'll be using this semester. Like Quarters, it's an incredibly powerful software package, so we're only really going to scratch the surface of what it can do. ModelSim comes under the banner of Electronic Design Automation, or EDA tools. EDA tools are software packages which automate electronic design, essentially computer-assisted design, but specifically for electronics. Software like Quartus, Logisim, and Multisim all come under this banner. Before we get it up and running, however, I'm going to show you how to set up simulation in Quartus so that we can start writing and running test benches. I'm going to run this example using my Sandbox Quarters project. It's the project that I use to develop the modules for these screencasts. There's all sorts of files knocking about in there. The example test bench we'll work with in this video is the one bit full adder test bench that was shown in the Prelab screencast. Before we start running our simulations, we need to set up model sim in Quarters. If you're using the lab machines, some of this is likely to have already been done. But if you're working on your own laptop, you'll need to follow step by step. So the first thing I'm going to do is open up the one bit adder module and its test bench. The adder module is already the top level design entity, so that doesn't need changing. We're going to compile the test bench and run it in ModelSim. This process is separate from Quartus's compilation, so the test bench doesn't need to be part of the design hierarchy. On a fresh Quartus install, it has no idea what simulation tools it has available, so it can't do any quick linking and we can't just select Simulate in the toolbar. We can point Quartus towards ModelSim using the Options menu. You can find it in the Tools menu on the top bar. The Options menu has got a load of different things that we can change, but we're interested in the EDA Tools Options page. Opening up this page gives us a list of tools which can be linked to Quartus. These are EDA tools which focus on a single part of FPGA development, like simulation, synthesis or verification. The one we're interested in is Model Sim Altera, down at the bottom. Now, if you're on a lab machine, you might find that this box is already filled. So if it is, leave it as it is there and skip ahead to the next steps in the video. If the box is empty, however, this is where the path to our model sim software needs to go, so we can click the button next to it and browse to its location. On a default install, we can find the folder we need at C, Intel FPGA, 17.1, model sim underscore ASE, and then select the folder Win32ALOEM. So this is a specific folder in our Quartus installation directory. If you've installed Quartus at a different location on your laptop, then you'll need to adjust the path accordingly. So we now click Select Folder, and Quartus has been told where Model Sim lives. So the next thing we need to do is set our test bench to be compiled. Model Sim and Quartus can only deal with one test bench at a time, so we need to tell them which one we want to use. We can do this in the Design Settings menu, which can be accessed by right-clicking on our device in the Hierarchy tab of the Navigation pane. Again, the Settings window contains a load of tabs covering all sorts of different settings, but we're interested in the Simulation tab under EDA Tool Settings. The first thing we need to do here is specify the simulation tool we want to use, so set the drop-down box to Model Sim Altera. We then need to ensure that our output netlist is set to Verilog, and that our simulation doesn't automatically run, so make sure that this box is unticked. Now we need to specify our test bench, so select the radio button for Compile Test Bench and click the Test Benches button to open up a list of those available. So as you can see, this list is blank. This tells us that Quartus doesn't inherently know what is and isn't a test bench. Yes, we follow a naming convention to specify which files are for design and which are for testing, but Quartus doesn't pick up on this, so we need to create one ourselves. So we click New and name our test bench to one bit full adder underscore TB and add the file that we've already created. Make sure you select the test bench file, not the design file or any of the backups which will have been generated here. When you've hit open, you need to click Add to add our file to the list in this window. Press OK and you'll see that our test bench is now on our list. As it's the only test bench we've added, it's automatically selected in the drop down box. In the future, you'll have to repeat this process for every test bench that you create, and you'll build up a list of test benches that you can select from here. 
With all that set up, we can now start to simulate. First thing we'll do is compile to make sure all our design files are up to date. In theory, we could just perform analysis and elaboration here to generate the RTL netlist, as this is what ModelSim uses for simulation. But it's only a small design, so we might as well do a full compile. Once that's complete, we can run our simulation by navigating to the Tools menu and selecting Run Simulation Tool RTL Simulation. This command opens up ModelSim and prompts it to immediately run the test bench we've set in the device settings. If you get a Windows error here, it's because you've already got ModelSim open, so make sure it's closed before clicking on Simulate. So after a few seconds, model sim pops open and our simulation runs. As we've got that stop statement in there, the simulation pauses and shows us the test bench code. We can just close that pane and have a look at our signals. The model sim window is split into five main panes. Furthest on the left, we've got our instances. This pane displays our test bench's hierarchy, starting at the top level entity, which is our test bench itself, then the device under test and any sub-module that it instantiates. You'll notice that it also contains any procedural blocks that we've used in our test bench code. Next over is the objects pane. This is where the component parts of the instances are detailed. So here we've got our test benches input registers and output wires. You'll see that if we select different instances in the instance pane, it'll bring up the list of objects for each of those instances. So if we were wanting to track the signals on wire one of our adder, we can click on the device under test and select it here. Below our objects pane is the processors pane. This allows us to get a good look at the state of the procedural blocks in the design. As we've only got the initial block, there's not an awful lot to see here. But once we start working with more procedural stuff later in the semester, this will start to populate. Last, but by no means least, is the wave window. This is where we can display waveforms for any signal within our design. By default, this window is populated with the signals from the test bench. But as you'll see, it doesn't need to stay this way. So we've initially been provided with a zoomed-in view of the end of the simulation, which isn't particularly helpful. So we can use these zoom tools to get a better look at what's been done. We can zoom in or out, or select zoom full, which gives us an overall look at our waveforms. So over on the left, we can see that each line is a different signal in our test bench. We've got our inputs, our outputs, and the loop variable i. The waveforms that have been generated are showing how the signal varies over time. So our test bench applies the test vectors to A, B and carry in, and the result is shown underneath. With those delays in our test bench, the signals are held at that level for a specified amount of time, and this timescale is shown along the bottom. Note that the outputs respond to the test vectors instantaneously. This is because A, Verilog executes everything in parallel, so you're seeing the simulated result of applying these signals to a physical circuit, and B, this is just a functional simulation, so it doesn't account for anything like propagation delay, which we'll use some tricks to simulate in the next lab session. If we don't want any of these signals, we can just delete them, leaving only the ones that we're interested in. Or, if there are any missing, we can drag them from the objects pane and just drop them in the wave window. We can also drag from the instance and processes panes to add all signals related to those instances or processes, should we want to. If the signal's a single bit, then they're displayed as a waveform in the wave window, but if they're multi-bit, they're displayed as an actual value. This is because ModelSim has grouped the common signals and is displaying them to us in a way that it thinks will be most useful. We can click on the plus sign next to group signals to view each bit in the bus. Doing this for our loop integer shows us 32 different single bit signals, which indicates that our integer keyword in Verilog is physically implementing as a 32-bit register. Depending on what the signal represents, ModelSim may not automatically display it in the format we want, so we can manually change the radix of a wave group to something else. By right-clicking on the signal and opening the radix menu, we can display it in binary, octal, hex, unsigned or signed decimals, and so on. It saves us from having to manually interpret long binary values when we really want an integer representation.
so we can use the wave window to manually verify our designs. We look at the test vectors which have been generated and the resulting output, but this isn't particularly robust for when it comes to large designs. Instead, we can add some display statements to our test bench so that we can monitor values when the simulation is running. This gives us the ability to debug our circuit as the vectors are applied, like we would do using printf statements in a C++ program. In this example, we'll just add a single statement to display the loop counter and rerun analysis and elaboration. Now, when we run the simulation, we can see the loop iterations in the transcript window. As this is a small simulation, it's over before we can even look. But if this was a 16-hour test schedule, it would be handy to see these popping up as it goes along, if only for feedback that it is in fact continuing. In the next screencast, I'm going to take you through the design of a test bench step by step, and then show you how we can best analyse the design using the features of ModelSim.